When looking up the first of Resident Evil's many remakes, you are likely to come across the idea that it is the standard by which all other remakes should be compared. To some, it's the perfect example of what this type of release should do. And you know, normally I'd shy away from using words like perfect or best ever made in these videos, but I mean, this is the RE1 remake we're talking about. I'm no barometer for what the entire internet thinks, but it seems like everyone agrees the decisions made here represent the most ideal outcome when a video game remake is announced. So I figured maybe we could jump into why that is, and also, while we're at it, take a look at just about every version of the game you could conceivably get your hands on. The goal, of course, being to determine what's the perfect way to play the perfect remake. So if all of you will be so kind as to join me, Let's go ahead and drop all the pretenses. We are here to look at and hear about a game we already love, so that's exactly what we're going to do. Ladies, gentlemen, I'm Jared from Avalanche Reviews, and welcome back to the Resident Evil Retrospective. I think we all know Capcom has never, ever, ever shied away from re-releasing Resident Evil games with small tweaks, but up until 2002, they had never taken steps to completely rebuild a previously released entry like this. And if you ask me, we're pretty damn lucky they chose the first entry in the series. I mean, if we're putting on our cutthroat accountant hats, Resident Evil 2 did essentially double re one sales, and that makes it a much more attractive remake if you're the kind of person who only cares about money. To be fair though, it's not exactly like I can criticize anybody else handling their finances because I turned down at the very least two offers from Raid Shadow Legends every single year for a stupid amount of money just because I'm too much of an idiot to run ad reads on this channel. Now what's this on the bottom of the screen? Is that little block of text telling you to check the description for ways to support me? Yeah, that's a, let's get that out of here. That's not supposed to be there. Does it ever not hurt? Well anyways, the point is we're very lucky Capcom decided to remake the game that it did because it didn't exactly make a lot of financial sense to do so. But honestly, this entire remake thing probably would have never happened if it weren't for a very unlikely player. Nice During the development of the GameCube, Capcom entered into a pretty widely publicized agreement with Nintendo, and I assume most of you are already aware of that. But what you may not know is that Nintendo wanted specifically for Resident Evil to have a home on their little purple square. Yep, that's right. Before fan-favorite RE4 ever got printed on one of those cute little mini-DVDs, Capcom was hard at work porting over Resident Evil's 1, 2, 3, and Code Veronica. During that process, however, Shinji Mikami expressed concerns that Resident Evil 1's more primitive graphics ouch, and poor localization would look bad compared to the other games coming over to the console. And I'm sure it didn't hurt at all that RE1 was the only game on the list that Mikami had any personal hand in directing. So you could say his reputation was on the line here, and whether or not this was an ego-driven move or a genuine desire to improve his previous work, what we got was essentially the Resident Evil experience perfected. Every single square inch of that game had been faithfully recreated to a degree you still don't see very often today, and if that's where things ended, I'm sure all of us would have still been happy, but Mikami wasn't just trying to recreate something he had already made. In a lot of ways, he really wasn't trying to recreate much of anything at all. Instead, he wanted to finally produce his original vision for Resident Evil, unrestrained by its shoestring budget and the PS1's relatively limited hardware. And in case you somehow missed that culturally important moment, that's exactly what we got. A game that looked, felt, and acted like Resident Evil 1, only now there was all this new content that, according to Mikami, he always wanted to put there in the first place. So on top of getting to replay a game that we all already loved, we got to replay it in a way that was brand new without stretching the boundaries of survival horror too far. When writing this script, I had a list written out of all the additions or new stuff you could find in the game, and it's really not worth reading out because it's damn near endless, and if you were wondering, that's why this game is more often than not held up as the industry standard for remakes. I mean, I guess I've hyped this thing up enough, so what do you say we take a very close look at that first GameCube release?
The first, and in my opinion, most interesting release in our little list of ports is the 2002 GameCube original. This bad boy targets 30 frames per second and outputs a kind of disappointing 480i. And here's a fun little factoid for you. Out of all the RE games released on GameCube, Resident Evil 4 would be the only one to officially support its 480p progressive scan mode. And it's not like I necessarily have anything against interlaced video, but it's only acceptable when progressive scan is absolutely impossible. And if you've been around for a while, you probably knew this was coming, but the good news is we can force progressive scan via Swiss, a piece of hardware that can run on modified GameCubes and let you do stuff like launch disk images, enable unsupported video modes, or inject cheats. So for the very, very small amount of you who even care, all the footage we'll be looking at today will be 480p forced via Swiss, running through the Tink 5X for upscaling to 1440p. As far as gameplay is concerned, those of you who've already played Resident Evil on the PS1 are going to have no issues here. The tank controls, combat, and puzzles are all essentially the same, and they're exactly what you'll be expecting. Like I said though, things have been tweaked a bit. For example, your movement speed doesn't feel quite as fast as it was in the original, but you do seem to turn with a more narrow radius, meaning you're probably going to have an easier time getting around here in the remake, I assume combat is just about exactly like what could be found on that first PS1 disc, but with the addition of a very cool new mechanic. The self-defense item is something brand new to the series and definitely one of those what the hell took them so long to think of this kind of things. How it works is, when getting grabbed by a BOW, you can hit the left trigger and use what is essentially an improvised weapon to get them off of you. These things are one-time use items and they can be relatively rare. Plus enemy numbers and HP values have been tweaked accordingly, which is a nice way of saying they don't break the game's balancing, at least on its normal difficulty. They also gave us a very interesting twist on the classic T-virus infected zombie in the Crimson Heads. Basically, killing a zombie here in RE1 Remake without decapitating or burning it only results in them temporarily going down. While they're laying there on the ground, they're actually going through a further mutation and as you pass those corpses, the chances get higher and higher that they're going to get back up with sharpened bones protruding from their fingers and the ability to run at a full damn sprint. If you're looking to avoid this, which you definitely should be, you can burn any corpses you come across, but this is going to require you to keep two extra items on you if you're Jill and one extra if you're Chris. I mean, this is a survival horror game, they're not giving you anything for free. When I first came across these things, I just sort of assumed the document describing them was just giving me an in-universe explanation for a new enemy type that might be introduced at some point. And technically, I was right, I just wasn't aware that I'd be the one who was in control over whether or not I ever saw them. I mean, call me stupid, but I just sort of figured the enhanced processing power of the Nintendo GameCube meant that zombie corpses could stay around instead of disappearing when you leave a room like an RE1. And because of that little misunderstanding, that first crimson head getting up and chasing after me was a jump scare far surpassing the whole dog jumping through the window thing. Oh, and speaking of which, they put a very nice little fake out in that hallway for old heads, which is really nice. Like I was getting at before, there were a lot of small additions made to the layout of the Spencer Mansion. Sometimes this was done to shake things up for returning RE1 fans, but sometimes they were just adjoining hallways or shortcuts that could not only spice up, but better facilitate the backtracking that you're going to be doing a lot of. Oh, and also, there's a brand new antagonist in Lisa Trevor, daughter of the guy who designed this mansion for Oswald Spencer and key player in one of the most depressing storylines in RE history. As far as presentation is concerned, obviously everything's been recreated from the ground up and if you have eyes you can see that it looks amazing, but you really have to give this team credit for nailing that RE1 feel. I mean, they did take what I would call huge artistic liberties with major themes and designs, but somehow everything still feels like it belongs in that 240p PS1 Spencer mansion. And speaking of the Spencer Mansion, when I think RE, I think pre-rendered backgrounds, and when I think pre-rendered backgrounds, I think RE1 Remake has the best in the game, but now's probably a good time to mention we almost didn't get them. 
I know it sounds unbelievable, but at first Mikami and the team toyed with the idea of making the backdrops full 3D environments and only dropped that idea when they started benchmarking performance out of the not yet released GameCube. So for those of you who haven't yet caught on to how ironically funny that is, in the end this remake, which was supposed to make up for the original's PS1 era limitations, only stayed true to that PS1 look because of the introduction of even more limitations. Time truly is a flat circle. A second late, you would have fit nicely into a sandwich. The inventory seen a pretty massive redesign, and I don't know if it's just me, but that original blue, sort of Palm Pilot looking layout beats it by a country mile. More importantly though, at least in a historical video games kind of sense, this would mark the first time Capcom would start paying models in order to put their faces on RE characters. A trend that's still going pretty damn strong today, but to be totally honest with you, I never really paid attention to all this until roundabout Resident Evil 2 Remake's release. It's pretty great to see Julia Voth still models her old Jill outfit every once in a while, and while doing research for this video, I found this adorable picture of her and her husband pulling off a Jill and Chris picnic type of deal. I'm not exactly sure how this slots into a video about Resident Evil Remake, but it was way too cute to not include, so there you go. I've mentioned this a few different times on the retrospective, but back when RER released, I wasn't really aware of the disparity between displaying pre-rendered 2D graphics on a system versus real-time 3D ones. And as a PS2 owner at the time, I was well aware of what that console was capable of, but what I was seeing here on the GameCube looked to me like it was coming from 10 years in the future. At the time, I didn't have a computer in my room, and I had to use dial-up to visit Capcom's site dedicated to the remake. There I watched little embedded real-time players showing off teaser trailers for Remake and RE4 just about every day. And as more screenshots and heavily compressed videos began showing up on that site, I had made up my mind the GameCube was far and away more powerful than the PS2, which is one of those situations where you can be both wrong and right simultaneously. Really though, RE1R is just what I said it was at the start a perfected version of that original PlayStation release. I wouldn't say it necessarily replaces its predecessor because there's always going to be value in revisiting the origin point of the survival horror gameplay we all love. And besides that, there's something really earnest about seeing what Capcom was able to create with such mammoth limitations. So while it is still a remake, it is sort of its own thing at the same time. Okay, so I would say you guys have been adequately briefed and you're ready for the deep stuff, so let's get into the odd and quirky things I imagine you guys would be expecting from my videos anyways. And if you know me, you know damn well we've got to start with those beautiful pre-rendered backdrops. Even back when RE Remake first came out, these were something that the industry was trying to move far away from, so getting to see them represented by the vast achievements graphics tech had under its belt since the 90s was a genuine treat. In the PS1 era, the process for executing this look was relatively simple. First, you'd render out a 2D image and then apply mask textures to it for sections of the environment that'd be in front of your character obscuring their 3D model. And I guess you could say the process is roughly similar over on Remake, only it saw the inclusion of animated elements. Sometimes this means the entire background is a compressed video file, but mostly it's just a regular 2D pre-rendered image with video layers playing over top for very small animated sections. Ever since I first saw games like Parasite Eve 2 and Final Fantasy VIII use this animated pre-rendered background with 3D polygons on top of it thing, I've always thought it was interesting as hell. And what I found to be equally impressive is that the developers also included 3D objects that layer over the 2D environments, giving off a similar effect to the movies while saving on the storage cost of having too many compressed video files on a little mini DVD. If you never noticed before, these stairs right here in the graveyard and the room that they lead to are just video files with collision data applied to keep you from running through anything that should be in front of you on the Z-axis. The only 2D element in the room is this chain draped across the top of the screen here. And the same goes for this new area with the swinging chandelier. And I certainly can't miss out on the chance to take a shot at modern graphics tech by pointing out that we have full resolution, real-time reflections in a GameCube game which is the kind of feature set that you can throw around when you're only rendering out a few 3D objects on screen. Now you might figure this spot right here underneath the guardhouse is another example of CGI videos being used as backdrops, but it's actually a static 2D image with zero pre-rendered animations, which means the water droplets, splashes on the ground, and reflections are all real-time CGI. And the same goes for a majority of the game's light sources. 
Here in the main hall, nearly the entire image is 2D pre-rendered except for the flames burning on the candles. At this point, you might be wondering how someone would go about differentiating between 2D pre-rendered and real-time 3D, and the answer is actually kind of simple. It's compression. The real-time effects obviously aren't going to show any kind of block boundary compression artifacting, you know, because they're being rendered out in real time, but the pre-rendered elements are going to suffer from a hell of a lot of it because they had to shrink those things down to fit them on the disc. Here, let's head back to that main hallway and check out those candles again. See how they don't show any artifacting around the edges at all, even the sections on top of Jill's 3D character model. With a high contrast backdrop like Jill's blue uniform, we'd definitely be able to see any kind of funkiness, but it's clean and sharp, only showing the kind of aliasing that comes from upscaling 480p. As a comparison, check out this screen right here. The artifacting is all over the place, letting us know it's pre-rendered and compressed to hell and back. And keeping those handmade, high-quality backgrounds in mind, I was sort of blown away when I noticed the team had also rendered out special camera angles for cutscenes that the player would only ever see once and only for a few frames during that cutscene. Like this shot right here looking up at Barry and Jill from the ground and the one immediately after it looking down at them from the walkway. And yeah, maybe that doesn't sound all that crazy. I mean, cutscenes have different camera angles. It's not a stop the presses kind of proclamation, but you do have to keep in mind these things were comparatively massive and took a chunk of time to render out on what was top of the line workstations. Paying an artist to model, light, and render one of these things to only ever use it once and for less than a second is sort of crazy and a really good reason for why it wasn't something you saw more often back on the PS1 when render times took exponentially longer. And since we're talking about different camera angles, as the game switches backgrounds during a cutscene, you'll be able to notice a short pause, which some of you probably already figured out, is the backgrounds being loaded in and out of memory. And it's in no danger of ruining your time with the game, but I gotta admit the fluidity of action scenes is certainly dampened. I have however found that the effect can be mitigated depending on how you want to play Remake. This is footage I captured years ago from a GameCube with a relatively okay disk drive, and the pauses in between scenes are terrible. Look out! It's a monster! Let me take care of it! But here, I'm playing a disk image off of an SD card thanks to an ODE, so in theory I should have faster read speeds, and it does seem to work out that way. Look out! It's a monster! Let me take care of it! I mean, there are still pauses here, but they're just barely noticeable. I also found some interesting stuff going on at the left and right borders of the screen. These little blank pixels show up in cutscenes and gameplay, but they're not persistent. Some screens will have them and some won't. I couldn't really say why only a few pixels per line would do this, but at the time this would most definitely be cut off by a CRT's overscan, so I wouldn't be surprised if even the most hardcore fans of this game out there didn't know this was going on in front of them all these years. And I think that's about all the interesting stuff I was able to notice. The real takeaway here is that outside of my quirky little videos covering minute and meaningless graphical details, Resident Evil Remake was a meteor crashing into the gaming scene. It may not have had a massive financial impact, but the fact of the matter is, if you've developed a remake since RER's release, it's been held up to that game as a comparison. This thing set the damn bar for what it means to remake a beloved property, and I don't think you'd have many issues at all arguing that that bar's only been cleared a few times since. And that's great and all, but if you get into this style of game, this means something else to you as well. You could call it the beginning of the end, survival horror's last hurrah until it somehow made a resurgence in the modern indie scene. It delivered a style that was well on its way to falling out of favor and wrapped it in a presentation that was modern and impressive enough that I have to assume it was able to entice a few people who normally wouldn't get near this genre. Really, my only genuine complaint with this first release of the remake is that it can be significantly more difficult than the original on normal mode and a casual tiptoe through the daisies on easy. And, you know, maybe that's due to the fact that we have to either play a tank control driven game with the GameCube's less than ideal analog stick or use a D-pad so microscopically small that I'm not sure it wasn't just a punishment for all the shit I've talked about the N64's controller. 
Now obviously I'm not saying this is enough to keep anybody away and the evidence for that is the fact that it was released again on a console that was already capable of playing that original GameCube disc. I don't know about you guys, but I for one hope Capcom never ever changes. It wasn't too long after Resident Evil Remake was released that Nintendo's Wii would jump up to the top of the sales charts, and it was essentially an overclocked GameCube at heart, so a port of RER and RE0 was kind of a no-brainer. And yeah, you could literally get the same exact experience by putting your own GameCube disc into the Wii, but if you think that means I'm not going to spend a stupid amount of time scrutinizing every square pixel of this thing's video output, you must be new around here. I see. Like I very subtly hinted at before, you don't gain anything over the GameCube in this version of the remake outside of an officially supported 480p picture, but stick a pin in that, it'll come in handy later. You might as well just think of this as a straight port with almost no differences, and since you can just plug in your original GameCube controllers on the top of your Wii, it doesn't have to feel any different either. Basically everything remaining the same, and this thing having no real additions over the original, I know is going to sound like a downside, but you have to keep in mind this is Resident Evil Remake. It doesn't really need anything else to be added for it to be amazing. Honestly, one of the most interesting aspects of this port's existence has nothing to do with the game itself, but the jump from the GameCube's mini-disc form factor over to a traditional DVD. And with all the added space provided by the new format, Capcom decided to combine both discs of the remake into a single pressing, and I mean sure, why wouldn't they do that? They both equal out to maybe 2.8 gigs of data, which for the mathematically deficient out there, definitely fits on a nearly 5 gig DVD. So that being the case, imagine my honest and genuine surprise when the CG cutscenes here on the Wii port showed obvious signs of heavy video compression even when compared to the ones housed on those tiny GameCube discs. You know when I first started seeing them, I thought maybe these color errors and block boundary artifacts were actually present there on the GC but masked by dithering or something, but seeing the two side by side shows clearly these video files saw some dead serious compression before being packed onto that DVD. And if I may point your attention to the previously calculated math formula, this wasn't necessary. Really, they could have included much higher quality versions of these cutscenes if they A wanted to and B hadn't have lost the entirety of RER's source files. Now I know what you're thinking, maybe we could chalk this up to some difference in video output and believe you me, I had the same thought. So I took the liberty of popping both versions into an emulator which theoretically should take any internal video processing differences out of play and yep, the Wii port still exhibits blocks of wrong color information where areas that were supposed to be black end up as purple. And yes, I will be talking emulation a little bit later as well. Outside of the cutscenes though, there is a vast vast disparity in sharpness across these two ports. It's definitely what I would call significant, even for people who normally don't notice stuff like this. And keep in mind, these are both running at 480p and both video feeds are coming from a RetroTINK 5X with the exact same settings. I'm even using the exact same Wii component cable between the two consoles. I should probably also remind you that the GameCube port was being forced into 480p via Swiss, but it's not like that's magic or anything. It just tricks the GameCube into performing a process it was already able to do. It doesn't create any extra details, it just internally deinterlaces the ones that were already there. Now I sort of have two potential theories on this one. The first is that Capcom deinterlaced the game on their end in a really shitty way and then pressed that onto a disc, but the other is a combination of factors. The primary one being the fact that the Wii has always had pretty trash component video output, beaten out in a signal to noise ratio by its own predecessor, the GameCube. On top of that, I'm using an adapter that was built to take advantage of the GameCube's digital port, a really creative little feat of engineering that gives the GCHD Mark II access to the Cube's internal video feed. So in a sense, this might have been an unfair comparison, but I would argue we might be seeing a discrepancy so big it can't only be explained by better video output. On the plus side though, the much softer look does sort of mask the artifacts that can be seen in the animated 2D elements in the background, and if you're not really into aliased edges in video games, this might actually be closer to what you want anyways. However, if you are a sane person who wants the sharpest video humanly possible, you're gonna like what's coming next. Thanks, I'll take it. Just like with the N64, the Wii has a baked in quote unquote flicker filter. This was meant to cut down on aliasing and soften edges, giving the Wii's video output a smoother, more high-res look. 
and when it's viewed on a CRT, whether or not this filter actually looks good is a matter of subjectivity, but I can tell you objectively when upscaling the Wii's video output on a 4K TV, this filter ends up destroying the picture. But don't worry, we do have a way to salvage this. And a big shout out to Wobbling Pixels on YouTube for this info because I had no idea this was even a thing, but apparently you can disable the anti-flicker filter with the latest version of USB Loader GX, which is what I use to play disc images on my Wii anyway, so let's give it a shot. And I have to admit, at first I didn't really notice a difference. All of the text and 2D stuff was just as soft as it was before, but as soon as I loaded up my save, holy hell what a difference this makes. I mean, night and day territory, it's incredible how much sharper and clearer the picture is now. And it wasn't until I disabled it that I found out this flicker filter is so powerful it actually gets rid of the game's dithering. Imagine my sigh of relief after seeing that very familiar GameCube dither pattern again. Really, it's all upsides. I wasn't able to notice any glitches or instability, and my only real complaint is the fact that I had waited until I recorded most of the footage for this section before I started messing with this thing. Other than the soft video, compressed cutscenes, and the addition of one of those annoying ass motion control warning screens at the start of the game, this is 100% the Resident Evil remake you remember, making it a perfectly fine way to play the game. Despite me not liking this console very much, really none of what I mentioned is even a complaint. I mean, sure, it's not exactly how I'd like to see the game if given the choice, but like I said before, there are probably a few of you watching right now who would prefer this. And since it could be played with its original controller, I can't really think of any particular reason someone wouldn't want to play this part of the game outside of a dire hatred for Nintendo, which I can respect. This whole place is a killing zone. No, your eyes are not deceiving you, we are indeed talking straight PC emulation on Avalanche Reviews. Which is fitting because I love this stuff. And why wouldn't I? My very first experience with the amazing Chrono Trigger came after double clicking that ZSNES logo on my desktop, and I played through countless fan translations and overly expensive PS1 role playing games thanks to emulation. I mean hell, I exclusively use FPGA based hardware emulation for playing SNES, Genesis, Sega CD, and PC Engine. Which as you might imagine makes all of the why do you hate emulation so much comments a little frustrating to sift through. Yes, I may prefer the accuracy of real hardware most of the time, but recently it's getting really hard to justify that. Just to prove my little theory in the previous section, I downloaded Dolphin, a Wii and GameCube emulator I've used off and on for about as long as I can remember, and I was just blown away at how easy of a process it was to get it unpacked, installed, and have a game up and running. I essentially just downloaded it, unpacked its contents, opened the .exe, and pointed the thing at a disc image of RE Remake, and I was off to the races. Probably the longest part of the process was setting up my DualSense controller over Bluetooth and that might have lasted me maybe a minute. Now of course you can tinker if you want and you know I did but right out of the box you can be playing a Wii or GameCube game at native resolution in less time than it takes to finish this sentence. But you know damn well we didn't come here for no native resolution. Dolphin has the ability to upscale games to a staggeringly high degree, but for the purposes of this video, we'll just stick with a 6x scale at 4K. If you really want to, and if your hardware can handle it, you could pick a massive internal render resolution and the emulator will just super sample it down to whatever your monitor's base resolution is, which can look incredible. But in my opinion, at 4K, this image isn't exactly screaming for more pixels. I mean, look at this screen, it is sharp as a damn tack but some of you with a keen eye may have noticed that certain areas do look a little too sharp, which at least partly explains why I started moving towards real hardware captures in my videos. You see, emulators like this don't upscale images the same way a discrete scaler would. Similar to how a PC game is rendered, certain parts of the image are processed differently than others. So for example, I can apply anti-aliasing to the image here and it does nothing to the 2D elements on screen like the backgrounds and text because those are altered separately. And yes, I get why that sounds like a good idea, but look at the results. At default settings, using 4K output, this is what you'll get with 2D assets, and I think we can all agree, this is way too damn blurry, but forcing a nearest neighbor texture filter, things come out way too damn sharp. With your more traditional video scaler, an image is fed in and output as a similarly high res, but uniformly scaled one. 
meaning everything on screen gets scaled via the same process and as such, the resulting picture has a kind of visual cohesion to it. The Dolphin emulator by comparison has incredibly sharp alias 2D assets that clash heavily with the ultra smooth 3D ones. It's almost like the two elements are coming from absolutely different places and that's because as far as the emulator is concerned, they are. This effect is shown off really well here with Wesker. His face, hair, and skin all have smooth edges with no stair-stepping to be found, but look at the texture of his clothes, radio, and stars patch. They look like they're from a PS1 game. And I'm not even saying I don't like the way this looks. I absolutely love seeing 2D graphics upscaled so far they start pixelating, but I want my whole image either looking very sharp or very smooth and not both approaches coexisting in the same exact scene. This is all totally subjective though. I just thought it was really interesting and would give you guys a bit of a visualization of how real hardware scaling and emulation differ in their methods. After messing around with settings and figuring out what I liked, I settled on 4K output with 16x multi-sample anti-aliasing, although when you're playing GameCube games at this higher resolution, it's honestly not even necessary. Besides, the smoother you make the 3D graphics, the more compounded the previously mentioned issue gets. And on that note, even if you do like the smeary look of the default or antisotropic filtering, you might want to go ahead with nearest neighbor anyways. With any setting other than that, I noticed errors in artifacting in the 2D which can be best seen in the inventory screen. This is an old issue in the world of emulation and one of the main reasons I don't mess around with these things as much as I used to when I started my channel. When I'm upscaling old console footage and I see something strange like the bitmap errors in Code Veronica X on PS2, mistake or purposeful feature, I know it's a part of the actual game. But when I'm emulating, now I have to wonder if it's the game, my emulator, my settings, or even the back-end resolution I'm using. And when you make your living describing video stuff to people, that can make your life let's say needlessly complicated. On a pretty interesting side note, I had always thought the noisy picture on the GameCube original was just a side effect of my console, maybe some bad capacitors or just inherent video noise, but seeing the same noise via emulation was kind of cool. Sadly, I wasn't able to find any other interesting visual quirks other than the shadow maps looking really awful at this resolution. Outside of my obsession with presentation though, as far as gameplay goes, there are no trade-offs that I could find. I was able to use my PS5 DualSense controller and playing this game with a D-pad that's worth half a damn is pretty amazing. It still outputs 30 frames per second and I can't really find any fan-made hacks or patches letting it hit 60, but we will get to see old Biohazard running at a proper frame rate in a bit, don't you worry. And just like my conclusion with the Wii port, I really can't think of any reason someone shouldn't play Remake on an emulator. The process is so dead simple, literally anyone could do it, and you also get benefits like save states, dumb little video filters, and theoretically being able to use any controller you want. Now, I definitely wouldn't prefer my 2D and 3D graphics looking so wildly different from each other, but I mean, come on, it's free. You don't have to engage with the flat out psychotic price hikes the retro collecting market has seen in the last five years, and you don't need to learn a new skill set in setting up retro video scalers just to play some Resident Evil. So yeah, obviously emulation is a great way to play most video games, and if I don't include a section like this in a future video, just kind of assume the conclusion is the same there as well. To be totally honest, I'm still not sure what spurred this on, but in 2015, seemingly out of nowhere, Capcom announced that they would be remastering the Resident Evil remake, making for one of the dumbest sounding titles I've ever heard before. The Resident Evil Remake Remaster. Add the word revenge in there and you've got yourself a solid contender for a dope ass 70s Hong Kong action movie title. This remaster was announced for the major consoles of the day, that being the Xbox One and PS4, but it would also hit PS3s, 360s, and PC. Now I have no doubt each one of these is going to have quirks unique to their hardware, but for the most part they all offer the same experience, so I'm not going to spend an hour on each one of these and I probably won't cover every single port, but we will talk about some interesting stuff I promise. And speaking of interesting, game remasters can wildly vary in quality, but for the most part they all follow a pretty standardized process. A process that was going to have to go out the window given a good portion of RER's assets are pre-rendered 2D. And Capcom, and one of the more Capcom moves they could have made, just completely trashed the original source code and project files so there would be no access to the higher quality renders that were likely created during the original's development period. 
meaning one of two things. Either they were going to need to spend a lot of money remaking and re-rendering those image files, or a multi-million dollar company was about to have to rip assets from a GameCube disc in order to make a video game. So obviously, Capcom decided on the latter and fed all of the pre-rendered backgrounds into an upscaling AI, and the results were not exactly great. I'm getting you worried, aren't I? To counter that though, they did decide to include a 16x9 widescreen option, a decision likely inspired by the absolute morons who reviewed the Wii's Resident Evil Archives release and were upset that they didn't stretch the game to fit a widescreen display. Game journalism. It has literally never been good. And if you're unaware why that's so dumb, keep in mind a majority of Resident Evil Remake is just 2D pre-rendered images. There's no real way to open up the field of view in this game because that would require each and every single image to be recreated and re-rendered but wider. Which admittedly would have been kind of cool to see, but they took a less effective, yet more interesting avenue. They instead zoomed the camera in so the screen would be filled horizontally, kind of like what I'm doing right now which as you can see, cuts off a huge portion of the top and bottom of the screen. Where the interesting part comes in is when you get near those cut off portions and the camera pans vertically to show you the rest of the image. And honestly, it's sort of the perfect fix. Someone like me who is never going to use that option anyways can play the game in its original 4x3, but if you want to see it in widescreen, you don't have to wonder if one of the effects of the T-Virus is instantaneous obesity. And after spending all that time hyping up what an interesting decision that is, and it is, I do have to say I can't recommend more firmly that you do not use the widescreen option. And for once, the argument isn't because I said so. Well, it's not all that. I mean, there's elements of it in there. What the hell is this thing? Like I mentioned above, each one of the game's backgrounds had to be upscaled to HD with images ripped off of a GameCube disc acting as the masters. And as you could imagine, a set of images that already show compression artifacts at 480i were going to make for some pretty unideal source files. That being the case, these backgrounds are not a joy to look at. Some of them can be okay enough and even good sometimes, but you're going to come across way more screens that show what seem like oversharpened ringing artifacts that somehow exist on an image that's still really blurry. And when you enable widescreen, you're zooming into those awful looking pre-renders really damn far, making for what I would call a nasty visual experience. Besides that though, you got to keep in mind that the camera angles in Classic RE are pre-rendered for a reason. Well, a few reasons. Outside of the obvious technical limitations, they use these things the same way a cinematographer would on a movie. There are Dutch angles that'll subconsciously make you feel uncomfortable and voyeuristic shots that give you the impression you're some kind of unseen observer at all the craziness going down in the Spencer Mansion. Good camera angles can affect you in ways you may not even be conscious of in the moment. It's a really effective trick, one that often separates RE from the type of games meant to clone the series. So you take those angles, cut off about 40% of the vertical viewing space, and then change its placement, and the effect can be diminished at best and ruined at worst. So if you can help it, don't use widescreen mode. On the plus side, Capcom would eventually learn from their mistakes and give us some really high quality upscales in the RE Zero remaster, which does make widescreen a much more viable option there, but here in RE One, it's just best to leave things the way they were originally designed. And on the polar opposite side of that spectrum, 3D models here received a more traditional remaster treatment. That being a straight up res along with replacing some of the lower res 2D elements that stood out so hard in emulation. On top of that, a few characters faces have been redrawn and some more convincing animations were added to them as well. If you ask me though, one of the more interesting aspects of this remaster's development are the pre-rendered animated elements. All those video files that played in the background in the GameCube original were already showing serious signs of low resolution and high compression. And since Capcom didn't have access to the original renders, there really wasn't much that could be done to keep them from looking like absolute garbage. So the solution was to replace any animated elements with real-time 3D, and the information about this online seems to be all over the place. In everyone's defense, Capcom is pretty vague in their description of this, but if you go by comment sections and forum posts, people seem to be under the impression that all of the animated images were replaced with 3D, but I found plenty of places where that's just not the case. Like here on the way to Lisa Trevor's cabin, they kept the original waterfall animation, which looks awful. And here, the animated shadows are still pre-rendered, but the fire's been replaced with 3D. It's a mix all over the place, and the only constants I've been able to find are grass, trees, and light sources. 
on the plus side, it is done in a way that would probably be hard for any normal person to even detect, but on the more negative side, in areas with a lot of animation, I found only a few elements would be 3D and the rest had become static 2D. It looks like they just took a screenshot of the CG animation and upscaled it, but only replaced a few of the moving elements with 3D. In some areas it can have a great effect, but in others I sort of prefer the original low res movie files. At first, I was under the impression that all of the CG cutscenes were cleaned up significantly, but it seems like it was just the intro and endings that got the personal touch. Now looking at the original and the remaster side by side, they did do a hell of a lot of work to the intro, but the rest of the cutscenes look pretty bad and you can tell they were just fed through an AI with little manual tuning. In an understandable but nevertheless sad move, we have a new control scheme here in remaster. One that's going to let you use a more typical style of third person controls, meaning they're locked to the camera's perspective as opposed to the characters. Like you might imagine, this feels really alien in a classic Resident Evil game. You can maneuver unnaturally fast and there's no longer a need for quick turns because you could be facing the other direction much quicker just by pressing the analog stick away from where you're looking. I can't help but feel like this breaks the game's intended difficulty, but on the plus side it can be turned off, and even when it's on, the new controls are just mapped to the analog stick, so you can still use the better option on the D-pad if you want to. In the end, RE fans ended up with what I would call a reasonably serviceable remaster. You could certainly make a case for laziness on part of the poorly upscaled backgrounds, but I feel like your average RE remake enjoyer isn't going to mind that all too much. Getting to see this game's stunning visuals at a higher resolution is admittedly really awesome. It's so awesome in fact that even when the job gets fumbled this bad, the end result can still be kinda great. And in the spirit of disproving that statement, I figured we could work our way backwards with the ports of the remaster going from the least powerful platform to the most. Sound like a plan? Too bad, we're doing it anyways. And starting off at the bottom of the barrel, we have the port that none of you are going to play, so I don't know why I even bother, the PS3. This bad boy is locked at native 720p no matter what you set your console's output to, which means instead of internally upscaling the image to 1080p, your console's just going to switch to 720 after the game is launched. Just like every other console port of the remaster, Resident Evil Remake on PS3 targets 30 frames per second. Now it's important to mention that the original was a 30 FPS game and I did used to be the guy who said 60 FPS wasn't necessary for survival horror games like this, but after playing a lot of remaster on PC, the one and only platform where 60 FPS is possible, I could say I might have been wrong. But I guess it doesn't really matter though because like I said you aren't going to get that frame rate on any of the console ports. And in the grand scheme of things, having the remaster run exactly like the original is not the worst thing in the world. As far as actually playing the game goes, this is just RE1R. Aside from the more modern control option that you don't have to use, the game moves and feels exactly like it did on the GameCube. One very cool and maybe unrelated thing I learned recently is that you can use a PS4 controller on a PS3 both over Bluetooth or USB. For some reason the PlayStation button doesn't work, but the D-pad on PS4 is really good and it just feels right for tank controls. Now this is the PS3 we're talking about, so you probably should have seen this coming, but that 30 FPS target I mentioned earlier is more like a soft 25 in motion. Sometimes you'll be able to lock in 30, but most of the time you'll be bouncing between 25 and 28. In some rooms, depending on what's going on, it can go significantly lower. And I didn't really expect this, but interestingly the cutscenes seem to be the hardest hit by the lack of performance. You could see them dip below 20 FPS sometimes. Visually speaking, I noticed a few things, and the first one is sort of par for the course. Back in the early days of this type of release, the words HD and remaster meant adding three things on top of the obvious upresing. Overly high contrast levels, film grain where there was none, and of course light sources you can no longer see thanks to annoying levels of bloom. And you're going to find that to varying levels across all the consoles we cover today, but on PS3 that overly high contrast thing is way worse. I had to back out and check my system settings to make sure my HDMI black levels were the same as my capture card because this thing is dark as hell. At first, I kind of figured this was just a move to obscure the badly upscaled pre-rendered backgrounds, but the rest of the ports seem not to suffer from this issue, so maybe it's just a PS3 thing. I hate to say it, but this is a very poor showing as far as ports go. 
No GameCube game should be struggling to hit its target frame rate on a PS3, and this thing has some quirks making it look a little worse than some of the other ports we'll be checking out later. But hey, like I said at the start, none of you are going to play this version of the game anyways, so I'm not really sure why I wasted my time doing this. A can of fizz. It's sure to yellow and mellow those things. Okay, so I'll level with you. The Nintendo Switch has been a bit of a punching bag for me since before it launched. I didn't really like that its performance was taking a hit so that it could stretch its limited resources across two use cases. Essentially a console made for both portability and home use, but optimized for neither. But all that being said, this right here is where the Switch does well enough for even me to notice. Its limited resources may make modern gaming an issue, but old PS2 era remasters is where it shines. Or at the very least where it should shine. There are examples of this not being the case, but here we can firmly place a check in the W category. This port maintains the console curse of 30 FPS, but on the plus side it is a much more high resolution image than what could be found on PS3. Which is kind of surprising, because if you didn't already know this, Switch games more often than not will use a 720p base resolution that it then internally upscales and outputs as 1080p, but that doesn't seem to be going on here. Looking at the PS3 and Switch side by side, it's pretty clear this isn't a 720p image. I don't want to rush to assume it's a native 1080p picture because that's not exactly something that's common on this system, although we have seen it before. More likely, it's something like 900p. Whatever it is though, it's a damn sight better than what we were just looking at. Control-wise, you can obviously use the Switch's built-in Joy-Cons, but I found the D-pad on the Pro Controller to be nice and responsive. It's sort of clicky and forgiving when I'm not perfectly holding a direction. The performance here is definitely much better than the PS3 port, but it's not exactly locked at 30 either. Most of the time you won't notice any slowdown, but some of the rooms that tricked up the PS3 also show signs of frame drops here on the Switch. Don't worry though, it definitely doesn't come close to making the gameplay worse. It's just sort of interesting to see that the performance issues are likely not due to the platform, but probably some shoddy optimization on Capcom's end. And speaking about stuff sort of tangentially related to performance, I noticed something really unusual here. You know those world famous Resident Evil door opening animations? The ones that are there to mask the console loading in the next area? Well load times are so bad here on Switch that these animations no longer perform their job. We're left with a pretty significant amount of time spent looking at a black screen after these things are done playing in some scenarios, and I really do mean significant. Grab my hand! <sighs> And while it's not an all the time type of deal, it is going to happen more often than you'd probably like. I'm happy to say that the gross looking contrast levels on the PS3 aren't present here and it makes a really big improvement on how good the picture looks. It actually makes some of the lesser quality backgrounds look a little better by comparison. I mean sure, they still look bad, but at least it doesn't look like someone tried to cover up how bad they look. Just like the PS3 port and basically every port we're going to look at today, this version has slight letterboxing on the top and bottom of the screen. What's really weird though is that the game's new bloom lighting seems to leak out behind that letterboxing, which tells me it's not some kind of a hard crop for the game screen, but instead just where the pre-rendered backgrounds end. That being the case, I imagine if you're looking hard enough, you'll probably find a few more examples of this happening. And lastly, there are these dumb little achievements that pop up here on Switch. They're not terribly annoying, but I imagine someone playing this game for the first time might get drug out of the atmosphere if one of these pops up at the right moment. Also, I can't find an option to turn them off in-game. I'm sure there's some kind of setting on the Switch, but I just wasn't able to find it. Other than that though, I'd say this is a killer way to play the RE1 remaster. Sure, the performance and presentation isn't exactly perfect, but the amount of trade-offs number far less than the upsides, and on the plus side, I found the Switch's built-in screen and portable mode to be one of the only occasions where I'd recommend forcing the 16x9 setting. It's certainly small enough, and you'll probably be far enough away from it that a lot of the quality issues may not even be noticeable. So in what's becoming a worrying trend on this channel, I've got to give the Switch port a pretty hearty recommendation. Honestly, if this happens again, I'm just going to lie and say it's bad, so enjoy the W's while you can, Switch fans. You alright? What's gotten into you? The Xbox One and PS4 ports of RE Remake were sort of the de facto versions of the game, seeing as how these consoles were the heavy hitters of its day. 
We're looking at the PS4 release right now, which targets a frame rate of 30 FPS, but making up for that, we have an internal native 1080p image. As far as features go, there really isn't anything here that can't be found on any other port, so to keep me and you from being bored out of our collective minds, I found some small visual quirks to hyperfocus on. For example, I noticed the CG cutscenes have significant artifacting in certain dark shaded areas. I had to go back and make sure, but this isn't happening in any other port. It's kind of weird to see a bug like this affecting a pre-rendered cutscene. I mean, there's no reason these cutscenes should be encoded in any different way than any other version we've looked at, so I don't know, it's kind of weird. Now this might be connected, or it might not be, but I also found that the film grain in this port was way easier to notice. It might just be a brightness difference, but in some areas it was way too strong for me. The same issue with the light sources bleeding past the boundaries of the pre-rendered backgrounds can be found here, making the PS3 and PC versions the only ones not to exhibit this little oversight. It didn't really seem to me like this port struggled with keeping that 30fps ceiling in sight very often, but there were areas where I found some noticeable frame drops. I played up until the guardhouse and really only felt it twice, so I'd say it's not worth worrying over or anything. And to tell you the truth, there really wasn't a whole lot else going on here. Well, other than kick-ass survival horror goodness. Luckily though, we do have something coming up to complicate this nice, simple port video. Yay. Chris, this way. With Sony oddly being one of the only big console developers to figure out what the words backwards and compatible means, we can play RE1 Remake Remaster on our PS5, and to tell you the truth, there's not much else to say here. We've got that same console 30fps lock and the same 1080p picture, only now it's getting internally upscaled to 4K, and if I'm gonna level with you, it's a relatively soft upscale, but that's when I'm looking for differences on a big ass monitor sitting inches away from my nose. Probably not something most people would notice, let alone care about. It is just that same PS4 release, so you are still going to be able to make out those color artifacts in dark areas, which does kind of suck, but is really interesting to talk about, so I guess it kind of evens itself out. Honestly, I'm a little disappointed here. I mean, you've got to imagine it wouldn't have been too hard to just open up the game's frame rate when played on a PS5 or Series X, but we're sort of left with a bare minimum in this port. Now mind you, the bare minimum is being able to play an incredible video game on your brand new TV in a way that will probably look better than if you let that same TV scale the PS4 version's 1080p, so it's not the worst deal I could imagine. But there is a better one to be found if you're looking to roll up your sleeves and do a little prep work. Okay, a lot of prep work. What the hell is this thing? The PC port of this remaster is probably the most interesting version available, and while normally the word interesting on this channel has a more positive connotation, this ain't one of those times. This PC port allows for at least 4K output, and unlike any other version of Resident Evil Remake, remastered or otherwise, this is the only one that'll target 60 frames per second it. per second it. <laughs> God damn it. This is the only one to target 60 frames per second, making it the only stop for snobs like me. But we will dive deeper into that just after I talk about the literal hellfire I had to walk through in order to get this game working and working the way that I wanted it to. And for a title that's currently selling on Steam, being sold by a developer that is massive, you'd figure things wouldn't be quite so broken. Although we do currently live in a universe that Bethesda also exists in, so... You know, rock bottom ain't exactly where it used to be. To start things off, I went to open up RER specifically to get footage for this video a while ago, and I was able to capture a bit, but that was also the day I started studying really hard for an upcoming Japanese final, so this project sort of fell by the wayside for a week or two. Now you might assume that two weeks of not playing a game on Steam wouldn't completely break it, but that's exactly what happened. Of course, I'm no stranger to getting old PC games working on newer versions of Windows, so I went straight into looking for missing.dll's and I did find a few people listing that to be a known problem, but it wasn't fixing what was happening to me. Then I remember this game uses a bog standard WMV container for a lot of its assets and not having certain features of Windows Media Player turned on can mess with it, but again, this did nothing for me. I really mean it when I say I was at my wits end at this point. Some of you guys will probably know the frustrations of troubleshooting stuff like this and if you don't, please, never try and find out. So what was the issue? 
Well, by far the least publicized of this version's quirks is the fact that it refuses to open if you've enabled any video scaling on your GPU. I'm not sure if this also applies to AMD cards, but after going into Nvidia's little companion software, I shifted any scaling to the monitor and the game started with zero issues. Well, zero issues in that realm. After all of that, I got to the options screen and found the highest I could adjust the in-game resolution was 2560 by 1600 something made all the more strange by the fact that the game doesn't seem to support the much more common 2560 by 1440 or 1440p. So I did play it like that for a while, but it didn't feel right. I knew I'd played this game at resolutions higher than that before, and I did. It turns out this list only stops because the team didn't tell it to go any higher, not because the game doesn't support those resolutions. Going into the games.ini file, I was able to set it to 4K, and since then I've had zero issues. It seems really weird to lock supported video modes behind a text file in the install directory, but hey, who am I to criticize shitty Capcom and their shitty work? After getting the display resolution and startup issues sorted, I went to play some RER and ran into another speed bump. The game will recognize Sony controllers and you can control the game with them, but it's expecting an Xbox controller, which means the old direct input versus X input issue. And if that means nothing to you, I'm basically saying you won't be able to use your D-pad. On the plus side though, this little problem is easily fixed. Just minimize the very important research you were doing for your super serious YouTube career and open the game's Steam properties. Then you just go to controller and enable Steam input, which will have Steam catching and interpreting all of your inputs and then translating them into something the game's expecting. And just like that, every single issue is solved and we can finally play this video game. Unless you've already noticed there's still something not quite right here, which I'll be fair and say is not something you can necessarily blame on this port. Jumping this game all the way up to 4K, while really awesome, only makes the poorly upscaled backgrounds even worse to look at. Details that were sort of messed up at 1080p become massive eyesores here. So it's a bit of a bother, but like most things on PC, it can be modded. Which brings us to the RE Upscale project, something I've been aware of for a while now but never really messed around with until I started making this video. This mod aims to take the crappy upscales from Capcom and replace them with much higher quality ones that actually had effort put into them. According to the mod page, they were able to beat Capcom's work by grabbing their images straight off of the GameCube disc, upscaling them in Gigapixel AI to twice as big as they're supposed to be, then super sampling those massive images down to RER's base background resolution of 1920 by 1440 And to be honest, I really wasn't expecting too much going in. I figured we'd see the worst defenders looking slightly less awful, but man, this really does make a huge difference. One of the first obvious casualties to this process are the rampant compression artifacts you can find in the original. Using this mod, in most areas these artifacts were either greatly reduced or totally removed and it makes a noticeable difference if you play this remaster a few times. Here in the storeroom, the wood floors and walls all show pretty heavy artifacting, but with RE upscale things look worlds better. And not too far from that save point is another huge problem area here in the bathroom. The tiles have always shown nasty artifacts, but they've been totally eliminated here in the mod. This really is a must-have for anyone playing this game on PC. It really improves the experience to a point where I'm sort of just tempted to keep scrolling through examples for the rest of this video's runtime. Really though, the best thing was how this mod sort of stopped existing to me after about an hour or so. Instead of me searching every pre-rendered background for details that might have been improved, I was just able to play Resident Evil Remake again. In its vanilla form, I was always noticing little issues with the upscale and that had me taking my mind off of what I was doing, but with this mod installed, the backgrounds just sort of exist in the game world. This might sound like an odd thing to say about a visual mod, but installing the RE Upscale project just makes it easier to not see everything it fixes and that's a good thing. So yeah, essentially this mod may as well be bundled with the remaster when you download it on Steam. It's that important, and of course I will have it linked down in the description for you. Moving on though, the Resident Evil remaster on PC, aside from the higher resolutions it technically supports, holds one thing over every other port. It's 60 FPS gameplay. And listen, you guys have heard me say it right here on this channel before, 30 FPS in an early RE game is perfectly fine. Which it is. I mean, I just played through every damn version of the remaster and it's 30 frame per second output didn't bother me at all. But you know, when you have it as an option, it is pretty awesome. I mean, look at how smooth this is by comparison. Ah. Ah. I'm 
I'm hoping it has a similar effect when you're just watching here on YouTube, but I can assure you when the controller is in your hands, the feeling is well worth the hoops I had to jump through in order to play this port. Now, I wouldn't say it necessarily contributed to me playing the game better, since RE1's always been about good planning, memorization, and item management, as opposed to Twitch reaction time and fast inputs. But that being said, I was able to bait out zombie grabs a little more consistently here on PC. In all fairness though, that is something I'm so bad at, there's always a chance randomness is more to blame. Either way, don't come into this expecting it to revolutionize how well you play the game, just how smooth it is when you're playing it poorly. I also noticed that the 3D animations added in Remaster play out at 60 frames per second as well, which shows me that's how they were intended to work and kind of makes me question why every single console port had to be nerfed so bad. One thing that's always struck me as pretty weird about this specific port of RER is the hard shift towards pink or purple and its black levels. This is visible throughout the entire game, but it's easiest to notice in the pillar boxing during CG cutscenes. And the weirdest part is, it seems to be strongest in the upper left hand corner of the screen. It's slight enough most people probably never saw it there before, but look how bad it is when we just place it next to an actual black bar. Pretty insane. Looking at every port of the console remaster, I wasn't able to find this exact behavior replicated. It's really strange it would just be in this version, and before you say it, I can assure you it's present both before and after applying the RE upscale mod. And you know, as much as it pains me to say this, I don't think I can find any more visual bugs or quirks. This port of the remaster offers what I would call a massively noticeable improvement over its competitors in terms of smoothness, but to be totally honest, all the issues I had getting the game running definitely could invalidate those gains, depending on your willingness to do manual work in order to get PC games working the way you want them to. So buyer beware, this version has the potential to be the best offering on the list by a country mile, but you're gonna have to wade through some thigh high shit to unlock it. Now personally, I've always been a tinkerer, so stuff like that never really deterred me, but there is genuinely nothing wrong with wanting to sit down to a video game and have it just work for you with minimal effort. Although if that is the case, I would recommend just staying away from PCs in general. I mean, I build these things for fun and god I hate them. So there we have it. 7 possible ways to experience the most pure, crystalline, refined form of survival horror anyone is likely to create. Well, 8 if you count emulation. The original remake of Resident Evil 1 is a game that will always live rent free in my head, if not solely for it being the first game I could really remember being so excited for that I went out of my way to follow its development. And the fact that Capcom actually made a good business move by providing it to an entire new generation in the form of the HD remaster. Well, it's not exactly something you would expect from a company regularly referred to as Crapcom. Between the different ports of both the original remake and the remaster of that remake, we didn't exactly see the kind of vast differences that usually make these videos so fun to have playing while you're trying to go to sleep. But we did get to see each console's quirky approach to video output and platform optimizations, which is always awesome. Or at least it is for me anyways. And speaking of me, I've got to get back to work, but I appreciate you guys spending a bit of your day with me. I hope I get to see you again in the next one, but if not, thanks so much for swinging by and checking out the Resident Evil Retrospective. And that is officially a wrap. Thank you so much for making it to the end guys. If you like what you saw here today, I would be happy as hell to have you as a supporter either on Patreon or here through YouTube memberships. And if you didn't notice, I had the incredible mono memory whip up a few tracks for me to use in my videos. If you're into synth and Resident Evil remixes, I cannot recommend their channel enough. It's absolutely amazing. And I think that's about it. So what do you say we meet back up here again in about, say, two weeks? Alright, see you then.